Genesis chapter number 41 is where we'll find our text this morning. If you look with me in verse number 45, we'll read that one verse, and then we'll skip down and we'll read a couple of additional verses a little bit later in the chapter. The Bible says, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah And he gave him to wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Look in verse number 50. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. I want to preach this morning a message that I've entitled Joseph's New Family. Joseph's New Family. In this series, much has been said about Joseph's birth family. We might say that he was born into a dysfunctional home, and that, that probably would be somewhat of an understatement, wouldn't it? Uh, to say that Joseph was born into a dysfunctional home. Uh, you see, Joseph's father was married to four women. <laughs> Let that sink in for just a moment. Four women, uh, but it gets crazier because two of the women were sisters. Now, I don't know anything more dysfunctional than that, a man having four wives, Two of them are sisters who grew up together. And can I tell you that because man is a sinner by nature, it was not possible for Jacob to love each of his wives equally. In other words, he did not have that ability within him to look at each of the, of the women and say, I love you just as much as I love the other one. See, he's a sinner by nature. He's not capable of that. That's one of the reasons why God said, marry one and be done. That's the way to go about it because God knows who we are and God understands how we, uh, how we function and how we operate. And so Jacob had a favorite wife. Her name was Rachel. And the only problem with Rachel was that she was barren while the other three wives were capable of bearing children. And it really led to a, a great deal of complication in the home, what was already a stressful environment because you have four women vying for the attention of one man and one man sets his heart on one woman above the others, but she's the one that cannot bear children while the others can. I mean, you just get the idea that it was a mess. I mean, it was just an absolute mess. It was a home that uh, no, no sane person would, would want to grow up in a place like that and would want to construct their lives in that sort of way. Uh, and yet one day, one day, finally, Rachel, the favorite wife, announces with much joy and with much glee and no doubt with a great deal of satisfaction, maybe even a bit of a vengeance over the others, she announces that I'm expecting. I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to bear a child. And Joseph, this character that we're studying, is the product of that relationship between Jacob and his favorite wife, Rachel. And because because she's his favorite wife and because she's waited so long to have a child and because her firstborn child is a son, very quickly, if not immediately, this son, Joseph, becomes Jacob's favorite son, leading to strife and issues among the brothers. Just as there was strife and issues among the wives towards Rachel, now there are there's strife and issues towards Joseph, who is the favorite the favorite son. Joseph's preferred status would grow to result in hatred among his brothers towards him, and they would eventually sell him into slavery where he would be carried down into Egypt to be sold to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery, and he would not be elevated to a position of leadership and authority until he was 30. The bitter days of Joseph's home life were not easily forgotten about. In fact, one might even be willing to excuse Joseph if, if he would have heartily protested what Pharaoh was trying to do in verse number 45. In other words, Pharaoh says, okay, you're now, you're now the second in command over all of my nation, and the, the one thing that you don't have that you need is a wife. We, we might have understood if Joseph was saying, now, now about that, sir. Listen, I, I, I appreciate all that you've done for me. 
And I, I really do think that I'm, I'm the right man to lead in this time that is coming of crisis. But let's just, let's just have this little talk about a wife. I don't need that. I'm, I'm good there. Well, why, why, are, why, are you, why, why don't you want a wife? Doesn't every, well, you got to understand, I grew up in a home, and, and he could have told his story. And then he could have said, and if that wasn't, any, if that wasn't uh, bad enough, I was sold to a, another home in which the wife of the man that I was sold to tried, uh, tried to, to, to take me into, uh, into her arms and tried to have me commit an immoral relationship. I, I'm good. I don't need a wife. <laughs> I don't need children. I've seen what brothers can do to one another. I'm good there. You know, I want to pause here for just a moment and say, you know, that there are a lot of times in which we we possess, it's, it's interesting that sin nature can take a good thing that has been abused by certain people and they can say, I don't want any part of that. Let me let me just let me just say something. Listen. The, the, the family, the concept of a family, the concept of a husband and a wife, the concept of two people committing their lives together for the rest of their lives, and those two people bearing children and raising those children, listen, that is still a very, very good thing. I realize we're living in a world in which a lot of you, maybe some of you, you grew up in a home in which it was conflict and it was strife and it, and it was no fun at all. And as a result, you're maybe a little leery saying, I don't, I don't want any part of that. And I just want to go on record to say, you should want a part of that because it's still God's plan. And just because some people have abused it, because some people have taken it and manipulated or twisted into something that ought not to be, should not result in especially God's people saying, no thanks. And, and let me just take it a step further. Can I, can I just say that there's a lot of people that are sitting at home today who refuse to darken the door of a church because at one point they came into a church and someone mistreated them. I get it. I get it. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you someone Someone has come into this church at one time or another, and someone in this church, maybe even the pastor, mistreated them in some way. I understand that. But I just want to say, I want to say this. Church is still a good thing. The gathering together of God's people is still God's plan. And we ought not just to write it off simply because it's somewhere along life's way someone hurt us or someone we saw someone do something that wasn't right or someone abused a position that they had can i take it a step further and can i just say you know we're we're coming into an election season and some of you are going to say some of you are sitting here saying well i'm just i'm sitting this one out i i'm i'm not going to the polls because you know all those guys are crooks and they're all bad guys and they're all no good and i can't trust a single one of them And to be honest with you, I sort of get where you're coming from, but I want you to know something. Civil government is still something that's been ordained by God. And God has given given those men, and in some cases those women, he has given them his power to to reign and, and hopefully to reward that which is good and to punish that which is evil. And I just want to say that for us just to distance ourselves from it is, is not a reasonable approach. It's not something that I think God would be pleased with. Joseph here, Joseph here doesn't use the excuse that, you know, well, I grew up in a dysfunctional home, therefore I don't want a home of my own. In fact, we see here that Joseph puts up no resistance whatsoever. I almost get the idea that he's He's excited about the fact that he's going to be given his own wife and he's going to have his own family. Why would Joseph have wanted a family? Even though every family he had been exposed to had been troubled and broken. I want to list three three reasons, I believe are biblical reasons, as to why Joseph would have would not have protested this, would have would have jumped at this opportunity just by way of introduction. Let me just share these three thoughts with you. Number one is because there, there is a natural longing within man to have a family of his own. And when I say within man, I'm speaking of within humanity. I'm talking about men and women. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter number two and verse number 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. In Genesis 2 and verse number 20, the Bible says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. 
Little girls are born with a natural longing to be married someday. From the time that they're very little, they pretend that they're, they're wearing a wedding dress, that they're walking down an aisle, that they're, that they're dancing with their Prince Charming. When they play with baby dolls, they hold that little baby in their arm and they pretend to be that little baby's mommy. And, and, uh, and, and, and moms and dads will often buy little kitchen sets for them to pretend like this is my house, this is my kitchen, this is what I'm making for my family. And perhaps while boys like to play, you know, cops and robbers and, 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 and like to play hide and go seek, maybe, maybe girls, their preferred game would be to play house and to, to imagine that I have a home of my own and I have children of my own. Why? Because there is a natural longing within man to have a family of his own. A young man begins to notice young ladies at a certain stage in life. What was previously uninteresting and unattractive to him is now quite appealing. Can I say that God has placed within all of us a desire naturally to have our own family? Though the Bible doesn't specifically state this, I believe it is implied that Joseph was grateful and he was blessed by the gift of of a companion, by the gift of a, a woman to come into his life and to be his bride and, and, and to be his companion, to be his partner throughout life. Can I say that not only is there a natural longing within man to have a family of his own, but can I also say that God has designed us, God has designed us as people to reproduce ourselves. And the only way to lawfully accomplish this is within the context of marriage. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. In Genesis chapter number two, God performs the marriage ceremony between Adam and Eve and the final verse of that chapter says that they were, the both of them were naked and they were unashamed. God is, God is saying in a very delicate way, in a very, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very appropriate way, that he is saying that, that they enjoyed a physical relationship with one another and they did so in an unashamed way. Why? Because this is the way that God designed it to be. It's, it's to be accomplished within a covenant relationship. God brought Adam and Eve together and he instructed them to be fruitful and to multiply themselves. We are created and designed by God with an ability to reproduce ourselves, to have children and to create another generation. God, our creator, has also not just designed us to be able to do that, but he has also designed the context or the parameters in which this reproduction is to take place. In other words, God, God, God didn't create us to be able to reproduce ourselves and then build no fences or no walls within that, within that context in which that should happen. We're not animals. Uh, we, we, don't find a, uh, we don't find a partner to mate with every single year. No, 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 no. God, God says, listen, I've designed you to be able to reproduce yourself, and here's, here's where that's to happen. That is to happen within a committed marriage relationship, a marriage relationship that is until death do us part. You have one, you have one partner, and you raise those children together. And by the way, we are reaping the consequences of disregarding this idea, aren't we? We got lots of children that are growing up in homes in which mom's around but dad's not. Or perhaps maybe, maybe they're splitting time. And by the way, if that's your context this morning, if that's the way you grew up, I, I don't say this to belittle you. I, I don't say this to marginalize you. I, I say this because that's, that's the world we're living in. I'm trying to help someone who's sitting in this room who has not yet made that decision to avoid catastrophe like you've had to experience. That, that's what we're trying to accomplish. We're not here to, to, to make your hard road even harder. But there is an element in which we're looking at a generation of kids who are being raised in single parent homes. And, and I just be, I just be frank, uh, you, know, you, you know, a mama can, can, can never be a mama and a daddy at the same time. I mean, she can never do all that is necessary. She do the best she can. And some of you were raised in that type of environment and you have so much respect for your mother who worked overtime just to, just to give you an opportunity, a shot at life. 
But you can understand how much better it would be for, uh, for, for your dad to have been around, for your dad to have been involved in the raising process of you. And so understand that God has designed us to reproduce ourselves, but only in the context of the marriage and the family. Can I say, thirdly, by way of introduction, that specific needs are met in the family that cannot be met any other way. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse number 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. A little bit later in that same chapter, the Bible says, therefore shall the man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now listen, Adam on his own was incomplete. God designed one who was like him, but different from him to meet these needs in his life. God referred to her as his help, his help. The word help means aid. A wife comes alongside her husband and is a perfect complement or aid to him. She brings, listen, she brings things to his life and home that he cannot typically provide on his own. She brings things like gentleness and nurturing and caring a softness to his home and to his life. She brings a beauty into his home that he cannot, he cannot provide. She is, she is the aid. She is the, she is the help that God has designed for him. Sometimes when thinking of needs being met, our minds go immediately to the physical or the sexual side of things. And I have to tell you, there is truth to that, that God designed the woman to be able to meet the needs of the man and vice versa. God designed the man to be able to meet the needs, meet the needs of the woman in that way. But can I say that it's, it's speaking about much more than that. A spouse meets the needs of companionship meets the needs of purpose, emotion, unity, and a host of other things. Joseph, listen, Joseph was an honorable man, but a wife would meet needs no one else could, maybe even needs that he didn't even know that he had. And so when Pharaoh proposed this, Joseph, I'm going to give you a wife. We might have understood if Joseph would have said, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. I, I don't need that. But we don't see that resistance. We perhaps see that Joseph is excited. He's, I've, I've dreamed for this day. I've longed for, uh, for this opportunity to have a family of my own. I grew up in such a messed up home. Perhaps maybe I can give my children something different than what I had. I want us to consider some reasons why it is good for a man to have a bride and for a woman to have a husband, regardless of your past experiences, the family concept is a beautiful and wonderful one. We've already stated that Satan has done a masterful job of staining and corrupting this beautiful design. But listen, listen, it still has not kept most of us within these walls from wanting to dwell within the parameters of a marriage and a home and a family. Most of you that are sitting here today, you, you've lived in the same world I have. The divorce lawyers are living in the nicest neighborhoods, driving the nicest cars because business is really, really good. And we've got, we've got judges and magistrates. All they do is try to settle the differences between a husband and a wife. Who's gonna get the children on what day and, and, and who's gonna get this and who's gonna get that? I get all of that. We, that's the world we live in. And yet the vast majority of us have said, in spite of that, I still long, I still long to have a family and a home of my own. On the day that Joseph was given freedom, power, and wealth, he was given something that exceeded these in worth and in value. He was given a family. You may look at the day you were married and the day that you had children, and you may maybe equate those days with other great days of your life. But I would say that from Joseph's comments here in verses 51 and 52, and, and just what Aseneth brought to his life, that, that family, listen, family exceeds all the other great days and moments of our lives that we sometimes compare them to. In other words, guys, the day that you got your wife was a whole lot better day than the day you got your pickup truck or your fishing boat or your you know, new rifle. And ladies, the day that you stood and you committed your life to your husband was a whole lot better day than the day that you got a shopping spree at Dillard's or Walmart or heavens, Walmart, come on, let's go, right? But you get, you get the idea, right? 
that, that sometimes we compare them. Some, what is some of the great, oh man, the day I got my diploma was a great day. That was a good day, but that doesn't compare to the day that you got a spouse. That doesn't compare to the day that your, your wife delivered your firstborn child. Oh no, those days, those days exceed and excel those other days by far. Let me share with you two main thoughts that I discover in this passage. Number one, can I say this, that in marriage, Joseph discovered that God blesses those who wait on him. God blesses those who wait on him. Now listen, in Genesis 39, Joseph was made an offer of a physical relationship with a woman who was not his wife. That's, that's exactly what plays out in Genesis 39. And no doubt, no doubt, she tempted him with her appearance, with her continual advances, and probably even with, this, with some promises that she made to him. Hey, listen, do this. No one will ever know. This time with me would truly, will truly satisfy you, Joseph. This is the thing that you're missing in life. Joseph, however, had a biblical understanding of the covenant relationship of marriage and he refused, listen, he steadfastly refused over and over again, day by day, he refused to be with her in this way. Genesis 39 and verse number nine, he says, there is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Why? Because thou art his wife. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, I get the marriage covenant, I get it. Though you don't get it, though you don't understand it, I do. And your, your, your husband has given me everything in his house but you. And the reason why he hasn't given you to me is because you are his wife. Then he says this, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? As I study Joseph's life, I think about three things as it relates to waiting on God. Number one, can I say this, that waiting on God is regret-free living. Waiting on God is regret-free living. Joseph was able to pillow his head each night, even in prison, knowing that he had done the right thing. Recently, I saw a quote and said this, the softest pillow is a clear conscience. The softest pillow is a clear conscience. In other words, being able to put your, put your head down every night knowing, knowing I'm not running from anything. I'm not hiding from anything. I've done what I'm supposed to do today. I've lived my life today in such a way. And those of you, perhaps maybe you have been running from some things. You say, what should I do? Because I don't have that clear conscience. You need to get right with God. You need to confess that sin to God. And you may even need to go to the person that you've sinned against and confess that sin to that person. And you need to be made right with the Lord and with those that you've offended. Had Joseph indulged in a sexual relationship prior to marrying Aseneth, he would have carried that with him for the rest of his life. He likely, listen, he likely would have been thrown in prison anyways. But this time, it would have been for a just cause. Joseph Waited on God, and as a result, listen, that leads to regret-free living. Some of you, some of you have violated God's laws, God's commands, God's instructions, and as a result, your life is miserable. Oh, you got what you wanted in that moment. The Bible does talk about the fact that there is some pleasure in sin for a season, but as a result, listen, you've lived the rest of your life every single day remembering the choices and the decisions that you made in that moment. I'm here to remind you, listen, obeying this book and waiting on God is regret-free living. Number two, let me say this, waiting on God, I believe, ensures fulfillment of your destiny. Waiting on God ensures fulfillment of your destiny. I'm certain that if Joseph would have given in to the temptation with Potiphar's wife, not only would he never have had the opportunity to marry Aseneth and raise two sons together, but he likely would never have advanced to a position of great power and authority in Egypt. In other words, choices and decisions Joseph was making all the way back in Genesis 39 were setting him up to be able to fulfill his destiny in Genesis 41. The Bible says about the man who would be a bishop, the man who would be a, a pastor, a shepherd, a caretaker in a church, he has to live his life in a certain way. That he has to be, uh, he has to, to, to meet the qualifications that are found there. And I think about that often. I was blessed to grow up in a, in a very Christian home, a very conservative home, a very strict home. But just like anybody else, I certainly would have had opportunities and could have gone my own way at a certain point in time in my life. And there were, there were definitely times in which I probably wanted to go my own way and do my own thing, and yet I 
was continually reminded of the fact, no, I've not been raised that way, and there are people that are, and I'm sitting here, to, I'm sitting here today and I'm saying that in some respects I am where I am today because of decisions I made when I was 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 years old. And some of you are sitting here today and you're in that stage, you're in that, that phase of your life. You are, you are just a young man, you are a young person and you're dreaming great dreams and you're thinking to yourself, I want to do something big someday with my life. And I just wanna remind you, you might never get there if you go your own way and you please your own flesh. But if you decide, you know, I'm gonna wait on God I'm gonna follow God, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do life God's way. I promise you this, that will lead to a fulfillment of your destiny. Number three, can I say this, that waiting on God guarantees his very best. The devil offered Joseph a premature experience with Potiphar's wife. The devil says, listen, you don't have to wait. You can have this right now, it can be yours. And Joseph said, no thanks. No thanks, I, I can't do that great wickedness and sin against God. That's another man's wife. Someday, Lord willing, someday I'll have my own wife and I can enjoy some element of that, but, but today is not that day. Joseph could have taken advantage of this offer and experienced a few moments of pleasure, but this would have been accompanied by a lifetime of regret. By waiting, Joseph was given a bride of his own to enjoy for all of life. A fling with Potiphar's wife could never compare with a lifetime of joy with the wife of his youth. And then I want to stop here for just a moment and think, about Asenath. You know, the Bible says that she, she was the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. So she was reared in a religious home, although likely a, a home that worshipped a multitude of gods. That was the way of the Egyptians. On was the great religious center of the nation of Egypt, and he was the priest in that particular city. And so it's likely that she, she grew up a pagan young girl it is, however, not reasonable to think that Joseph would have married a pagan and heathen, uh, a heathen worshiper. He would not have done that. Nor would God have blessed a marriage between Joseph, a, a by the way, a, a, a new, an Old Testament picture or type of Christ. God would not have blessed Joseph's life if he would have married a woman uh, who was a, a worshiper of false gods. I believe, I believe that Asenath likely converted to become a worshiper of Jehovah. Uh, and, and, and think about this for just a moment. Having grown up in a religious home, the daughter of a priest, she was more than familiar uh, with, what, with, with what a God expects out of his people. She would have been very familiar with the idea of worship and the idea of sacrifice and the idea of serving and the idea of giving oneself to the Lord. I believe that Joseph waited on God and he was blessed with his own wife. But beyond that, I believe he was blessed likely with a woman who shared his beliefs and his values and was deeply committed to worshiping the Lord alongside her husband. Joseph enjoyed a relationship without regret and without shame and a relationship that lasted a lifetime and a relationship, listen, with a compatible or a mutual companion throughout life as opposed to what he was offered by Potiphar's wife, a premature experience that would last just a few brief moments with someone who really didn't love him or care about him and had no interest in his values and what his desire or goals were in life. No, it was all about the physical. I'm here to tell you that the devil just about, used just about anything to get us off track, and I'm here to remind you that God blesses those who wait on him but can I say secondly that in parenting, Joseph discovered that God gives good gifts to his faithful servants. The product of Joseph's relationship with Asenath was two sons. Is there any greater gift that God can give after salvation and after a godly spouse than children? You know, I marvel that there are people in our world today who say, who, who say they don't want to have children. There are people like that. And there could be reasons for all of that. I I don't want to. I don't want to get inside their minds, but I'm sitting here saying that no children are such a joy. Children are a blessing, and by the way, children are a fulfillment of what God has created us to do as husband and wife. We are to be fruitful, and we are to multiply. I marvel that there be some that say, "I I, I don't want that," unless 
Unless you've had them, you can't possibly know the joy and love they bring. So perhaps that is simply inexperienced talking when someone says something like that. But can I remind you that children are a precious gift from the Lord? The Bible says in Psalm 127 and verse number, 20, verse number three, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Psalm 128, verses three and four, the Bible says, thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. If you wanna, if you wanna wonder uh, in what type of an environment the Bible was written, look at those two verses. Most of us do not refer to our wife as a, as a vine that grows up alongside of our house. And we do not refer to our children as olive plants. But if you would have grown up in that culture and, and in that environment, you probably would have understood the point that he was trying to make. He was trying to say that wives and children are so precious and they're so valuable and they're so wonderful. Especially precious in the days in which Joseph lived was the birth of a son who would carry on his father's name and legacy and Joseph was blessed double in this way. But along with the gift of his sons, a most precious gift in its own right, God gifted him with some other things as well that cannot be measured by silver and by gold. I want to share them with you and we'll be done. Number one, God blessed him with the gift of forgetfulness of a painful past. In the birth of his firstborn son, God blessed him with the gift of forgetfulness of his painful past. Look what he says in verse number 51. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. What painful things had Joseph endured in his life? Well, he was hated and betrayed by his brothers. He was sold as a slave in Egypt. He was lied about by Potiphar's wife. And he spent many long years in prison, could have been upwards of 12 or more years in prison for crimes that he did not commit. Truly, Joseph had been made to endure a painful past, but in this new season of life, God had given him the gift of forgetfulness. Forgetfulness of his toil in prison and in Potiphar's house. Forgetfulness of the hurts brought about by his brothers and his own family. When his firstborn son arrived, he named him Manasseh, which means forgetting. Joseph had learned that the blessings he was now enjoying, he was now enjoying more than made up for the pain that he had once endured. He Listen, Joseph was so busy leading, so busy thriving, so busy serving, succeeding, loving, and growing that he no longer had the time to bemoan and lament his painful and difficult past. It is not that he couldn't remember his past in a literal sense. Obviously, he remembers it. He talks about it in this verse. He talks about his toil. He talks about the pain and the hurt of his father's house. So he's not saying God has made me to forget these things in a literal sense, but here's what he's, here's what he's saying. He's saying God has made me to forget these, these painful moments in a figurative sense. In other words, God has so blessed me today that I hardly remember at all the pain of those days. Today I wear a smile on my face. Today my life has freedom and purpose and, and, and blessing and success, uh, all of these things were things that I did not enjoy for a significant portion of my life, but God has paid me back, and for that I am grateful and I am thankful. The gift of forgetfulness of a painful past, but notice secondly, the gift of fruitfulness in the place that was designed to break him. God not only gave Joseph the gift of forgetfulness of a painful past, but God gave Joseph the gift of fruitfulness in a place designed to break him. Isn't that just like our God, to do the impossible? You know what Joseph should have been doing? Joseph should have been in Egypt. He should have been probably in, in prison for the rest of his life because he had committed immorality with a woman that was not his wife. I mean, in, in, the, in a fleshly sense, in a human sense, that's probably where Joseph should have been. He should not have been sitting in a palace. He should not have been wearing the Pharaoh's ring. He should not have been wearing the Pharaoh's robe. He should not have had the authority and the power that he did. He should not have had a beautiful wife and two uh, beautiful, healthy sons. But God had given him all of those things in the place, in the very place that was designed to destroy him. Think about, think about Egypt for just a moment. His brothers sent him there so they wouldn't have to see him anymore. 
The devil sent him there to destroy him and to re- re- render him powerless to do anything of significance. Potiphar's wife sent him to prison because he wouldn't play along with her dirty scheme. But now look at him, the place designed by so many to break and abuse and destroy Joseph is the very place that he is thriving in. And it can be the same thing for you because the same, listen, the same God who is over Joseph and who led Joseph and who divinely worked in Joseph's life is the same God that we still serve today. The power that was available to Joseph is the same power that is available to us today. The birth of Joseph's second son led him to choose the name Ephraim, which means fruitfulness. Most assume that they cannot be fruitful unless the circumstances are just right. But the godly man knows that fruitfulness most often comes from seasons and times of affliction Psalm 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Would you take your Bible as we conclude and go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12? 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. See, this is not just an Old Testament concept. This is a New Testament concept as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, the apostle Paul laments a thorn in the flesh. We don't exactly know what it is. We can give some guesses. But we don't know what it is for sure. Paul learned some valuable lessons in this season of affliction. Look, he says in verse number seven, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know what he's saying? He's saying this was the place that the devil designed to break me. This was the place the devil designed to destroy me. Now go a little bit further. Verse number eight. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. You know what Paul says? Paul says, I asked to get out of this prison three times. I asked to be set free from this place three times. But notice God's answer, verse number nine. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, when I am in a place that is designed to break me, then, then am I strong. The point is this, the gift God alone is able to give us the gift of fruitfulness in the very place that was designed to break us. Some of you have been there. Some of you have dealt with some of the hardest, most difficult moments of life, and yet today, yet today, you soldier on. Smile on your face, peace of God in your heart, the purpose of God before you. You're fruitful. How can you be fruitful in the place of your affliction? How can you be fruitful in the place that was designed to break you? The grace of God. The grace of God is sufficient. The greatest gift, as we conclude this morning, The greatest gift God gives, it's not forgetfulness of a painful past. It's not even fruitfulness in a place that is designed to break us. All of those things are wonderful. But I want to remind you, the greatest gift that God gives, it's not even a wife or a husband, a son or a daughter. No, the greatest gift to mankind is eternal life and peace with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died in your place for your sins on an old rugged cross. He was buried for three days, but he didn't stay there. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And by the way, he is coming back. We alluded to that at the beginning of this message. Are you ready for him to return? You, you, may, you may not make it to the second coming of Christ. You may die before the second coming of Christ takes place. Are you ready to die? The Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you ready? Are you prepared to meet the Lord? You will discover in salvation that the greatest gift God gives is much more than just a companion to walk through life with you. It's much more than little children who bear your name and your image and your likeness. It's much more than forgetfulness or fruitfulness. No, the greatest gift God gives is eternal life. And he wants to give it to you today if you've never experienced it. 